Hello everyone. In this video, I want to provide an introduction to object-oriented programming, or OOP, in Python. There are two fundamental concepts that we should take some notes on before we get started. The first is class, and the second is object. Generally, a class is a collection of state and behavior that completely describes something. Generally, an object is an instance of a class. The most common metaphor used to introduce object-oriented programming is to think about a class like a blueprint for a house, and then to think about an object like a realization of that house from the blueprint. For example, let's say we're trying to model housing development and all of the houses in the housing development will be created from the same blueprint. So an architect designs the blueprint and then hands that blueprint off to a team of construction workers and welders and plumbers and electricians, etc. all the people that might be needed to create these houses. So let's say there's gonna be 100 houses in housing development then we would have 100 objects, one for each one of the houses created from a class, right? A blueprint, a collection of state and behavior that completely describes something. Now, each one of these houses might have slightly different state, like maybe one of the state, the attributes of the class would be something like house color. Maybe by default, the architect said that they should all be white but maybe some people who are buying these houses want different colors. So maybe two of the houses are green and three are yellow, four are red, etc. They all have a house color, but the different objects, different houses might have different values for those attributes. So thinking about this in terms of programming, state is really just variables, right? Storing some kind of state. If those variables belong to a class, then we call them attributes. Behavior is really algorithms, procedures, right? So those would be functions, and if the functions belong to a class, then we call them methods. So a class is really a grouping, a pairing of attributes and methods that model something. We have a definition for that model with a class, and then we can use that class to create objects which are essentially realizations of what we're trying to model, right? A hundred houses in a housing development. So let's see how we can do this in Python. Let's use a different example, just so we don't always go with the status quo here. Let's do a class for a subject in a research study. So this subject could be someone who's participating in a randomized clinical trial. Perhaps it could be someone who's responding to a survey they received in their email. Perhaps it's someone who's participating in a focus group to give feedback on a new design for a graphical user interface. Whatever. Really, just a subject because why not? It sounds kind of fun. It'll be like a modeling a person, uh, but with a fun attribute called measurements, which will essentially be a collection of measurements from this subject in the study. So to declare a class in Python, we use the class keyword, and then we have the name of our class. I'm using a capital S for our subject so that it's really clear that this is a type. When we def define a new class, we're actually creating a new type. We can make objects of that type and have references to those objects. So capital S for subject, this is a type, and then a colon. Now let's have a doc string in order to describe this class. So a short description would be represents a subject in a research study. Now let's describe the attributes of the subject class. So first, to uniquely identify a subject in a study, we might have a subject ID, SID, which will be a simple integer, a unique identifier for the subject. No two subjects will have the same subject ID. I'll show you how we can easily implement this using what's called a class level attribute here in a moment. Then let's say each subject has a name. This will be a string. And now measurements. 
So this will be a dictionary of string to float mappings. This represents the subjects time stamped measurements throughout the study. So the string will be a timestamp and then it will map to a float, which will be the measurement. Now, these three attributes are what we call instance level attributes. Each object will have its own unique SID, name, measurements, variables. We can also have what's called a class level attribute or class level attributes. We can have multiple of them. A class level attribute is not unique to each object, meaning there'll be only one variable for the class level attribute and it'll be shared amongst all subject objects. We'll have one class level attribute called num subjects. And this will be used to represent the total number of subjects in the study. We can use it essentially to implement what in databases is known as an auto increment primary key. Every time a new subject object is created, we will add one to num subjects. We can then use the value of num subjects to assign a unique SID to each new subject. So the first subject will have SID zero, then we'll increment num subjects by one. The next subject created will have SID of one, we'll increment num subjects by one, so on and so forth. I am now outside of my doc string here, and I'm going to declare num subjects and initialize it to zero. Because I am declaring this variable, this attribute, outside of a method and not using this special parameter called self, which I'll explain in a moment, this is a class level attribute. This means there is only one num subjects variable and it is shared across all subject objects. I'll make one more note here. Do not declare instance level attributes here. Meaning if you have an attribute and its value may be specific to an individual object, it's an instance level attribute, don't declare it here. If you have a value and it's the same across all objects, all instances, then declare it here. Now, where do we declare and initialize our instance level attributes, SID, name, and measurements? Well, we declare those in a special method called dunder init dunder. So dunder is short for double underscore. So that's what I have here. One, two underscores. And init is short for initialize or initializer. And it's used for initializing an object like a constructor. So if you're coming from a Java or C++ background where you're used to constructors, then init is like a constructor. It is used for constructing a new object. It's where we can essentially initialize the state for this object that's being created. So let's declare dunder init dunder. The first keyword will be self, which I'll explain in a moment. And then we'll require calling code to pass in a string for the name of this subject. We won't require calling code to pass in a subject ID because we are going to keep track of that internally using num subjects. And then optionally, we'll allow the calling code to pass in a list, or excuse me, pass in a dictionary of measurements. If there aren't any measurements for this subject yet, then they don't have to pass anything in. Measurements will be none, and we'll check for that in the body of our init method. So real quickly, what is self? Self is like the this keyword. If you're coming from a programming language that uses, say, a this reference or a this pointer, then self is like that. If this keyword does not sound familiar to you, no worries. 
here's a brief introduction to self. It essentially is a reference that refers to the current, aka the invoking object. Either one of these terms you can use, whichever one makes the most sense, use that one. So in an initializer, self is a reference to the object that we are initializing. So whenever we want to access something that's instance specific, like an instance level attribute, we'll have to do self dot and then the name of that instance level attribute in order to access the specific attribute for this specific object. So let's try it out. Self dot SID, this is going to create and initialize the SID instance level attribute for the current object that is being created, the one we have a reference to inside of init. Note, we're still in the blueprint. We're still in the class definition. We're not actually making a subject object right now, but when we do, this code will execute and we will initialize that object's SID to subject.numSubjects. Note that I'm using capital S subject here because subjects is a class level, a static attribute, meaning we do not need an instance of the subject class in order to access it. We can simply use capital S subject itself, which is the name of the type, the name of the class. Now we are adding a subject, so we should increment subject.numSubjects so that the next time a subject object is created, and this init executes, subject on subjects is one more than it was this time it executed. Like I said earlier, we're creating an auto incrementing primary key. So subject on subjects is always going to auto increment by one every time a new subject is created. When is a new subject created? In dunder init dunder. And then we can use that as a primary key, meaning a unique identifier for self.sid. Each one of our subjects will have a unique identifier based on when it was created. Next, self.name gets name. I'll note that I'm using shadowing here. So I have the name parameter, which is the same name, same identifier as our instance level attribute name, which is okay because in order to access the instance level attribute name, I have to use self dot in this context. I have to have a reference to the object. So self dot fully qualifies that I want to access the name instance level attribute, whereas name by itself is referring to the parameter, which is just a local variable. Now, a little if statement here. If measurements, the parameter is none, then that means measurements needs to be initialized to an empty dictionary. And then I'll do self dot measurements gets measurements. You may be tempted to initialize an empty dictionary here in the header for dunder init dunder. This can be really tricky to debug because when Python parses your Python file from top to bottom and it encounters a function or a method definition, it essentially executes that line. And so this would create an object, an empty dictionary, and then save the reference and it wouldn't execute again. So you would essentially be sharing this same dictionary over all subjects unless they were passing in, the calling code was passing in a dictionary reference. It's kind of tricky. Try it out if you want, uh, just so you can see why we don't generally do that unless that's something that you want, but not generally. So I'm using none here so that in the body of init, which does execute every single time, a new subject is made, I can create a dictionary and then save that unique reference for this particular instance, this object. Okay, Woo, that was a lot. Let's make some subjects. So I'll do sub one is assign subject open paren. I have to pass in a name. You can see the doc string showing up here. It's so nice, right? Ooh, represents a subject in a research study, attributes. Okay, so name is a string. I have to provide a name. Looks like measurements is a dictionary, but I don't have to provide a measurements variable value here, so I won't. So let's just do subject, and let's do a subject named 
bomb. So I'm gonna print out sub one. We'll get some strange output, but that's okay, we'll fix it. This will at least give us evidence that we were able to create a subject object. Okay, so I print it out and I get this weird output right here. It says dunder main dunder dot subject object at, and then we get this hex value. So this is essentially the default string representation of an object. Now, if we wanted to, we could customize this output here by implementing another special method. So let's do that. Def and then dunder stir dunder self. So dunder stir dunder is another special method just like dunder init dunder. And what's cool about it is it is invoked implicitly whenever a string representation of an object is needed. In fact, we're already familiar with this implicit invocation. For example, on line 39 here, we create a new subject which implicitly invoked our dunder init dunder. So this actually caused dunder init dunder to execute. So line 40, when we have a print statement, we pass in sub one, print needs a string representation of sub one. So implicitly, this dunder stir dunder is going to execute. Now, dunder stir dunder, like dunder init dunder, has to have self as the first parameter because it is an instance level method, meaning an actual object is needed to invoke it. Self will be a reference to that object. I'll show you an example of a few more methods here, another instance level method that's not a special method, and then a static or class level method that won't have self. It'll be really nice to see these two examples because they have slightly different syntax, and that's how you can tell the difference. Okay, so we need to return a string here. So let's return a string representation of our object. This will be really nice for debugging. So right here, in order to access the invoking or the current object's subject ID, I need self.sid. In order to use self, I have to have self and scope. So that's why we have a self parameter here. Like I said, behind the scenes, this will be a reference to whatever object is used to invoke dunder stir dunder, which will be sub one implicitly when print is called. So I'm just gonna echo back all of the values for my attributes here, my instance level attributes. And it looks like my font is kind of large here, so I'm going to break this over two lines. Okay, so I'm going to return a string with all of the values for my instance level attributes in the object that self refers to. So I'll run this again, and sub1 will be a reference to the same object that self refers to when this code executes. And you can see here that I've got the same output coming from dunder stir dunder when I'm implicitly invoking dunder stir dunder on line 42. So this is an implicit invocation of dunder stir dunder. So in this case, self refers to the same object that sub one refers to. We can also explicitly call special methods. So I could do print sub one dot dunder stir dunder and I'd get the same behavior. There it is. So let's take a moment and talk about this syntax here. Method invocation syntax. We have an object reference dot and then we have a name of a method and then open print, close print with some optional arguments here. This is the invocation in order to execute a method, an instance level method. 
Now, note that this is different than, say, calling a function like print. Print is a built-in function. It's not an instance-level method. And I know this by looking at its call. Okay, In front of the P, I don't have an object reference dot. But here, when I call dunder stir dunder, I do have an object reference sub1 and a dot. So just something to keep in mind if you're ever like, why does this look different? Or is this a function or is this a, an instance level method? Then look at the invocation syntax and that can give you a hint. All right, so looks like we were able to create one subject object representing Bob and we're able to get a nice debug string representation of this subject. So let's see how we can access a few of our attributes. So let's print out sub one dot say measurements. So access instance level attribute. And then let's also print out capital S subject dot num subjects where we can see how we can access a class level attribute. Okay, so we see an empty dictionary, makes sense. And then we see one, we have one total number of subjects that have been created so far. So if I were to say make another subject, let's do sub to get subject, let's do say Mary, and then I print out sub two, then I should see that Mary's SID is now one. If I were to print out num subjects again, which why not, let's do it. Num subjects should be two now. And it looks like it is. Awesome. Now let's see how we could actually go and modify the state of one of our subject objects. So let's say I have a measurement for Mary. So let's do sub two dot measurements. And let's do a timestamp, say like one, one, I don't know, 2000 at maybe 12 a.m., something like this. And let's say the measurement was 1.5, just making up a value here. So it looks like I'm able to add a measurement, a timestamp to value pair to Mary's measurements dictionary. And let's confirm that this did not affect Bob's measurements. They're still empty. So far, so good. Now, this is behavior here, right? Recording a measurement. We should encapsulate this behavior in a method inside of the subject class. So let's do that. We've created two special methods, dunder init dunder and dunder store dunder. Now let's create a instance level method, meaning you need an object of type subject in order to invoke it using the method invocation syntax. But it's not gonna be a special method, meaning it's not gonna be named such that it could be implicitly invoked or used by Python when needed. So let's call this record measurement. So record measurement is instance level, so it needs a reference to an instance, which will be self. It'll be implicitly assigned based on what object is before the dot and then record measurement when we invoke this method. And then we'll need a timestamp, which will be the key and its value. So I'll note here that we should do some error checking before we start blindly adding timestamp value pairs to our measurements dictionary. But for the sake of focusing on OOP today, We'll just put it as a to-do and focus on the OOP part, which is inside of an instance level method, I can access an instance level attribute with self.measurements sub timestamp gets value. So now let's clean this up. We'll do sub two dot record measurement. Notice I'm following the method invocation syntax here. So I have an object reference, sub two. It refers to a subject object. I have a instance level method name, 
record measurement. I know it's instance level because it has self as the first parameter. And now I'm gonna pass in a timestamp and a value. So now when this executes, self will refer to the same object as sub two. So I should get the same behavior here, but I'm doing this using a more OOP design where I'm pushing that behavior into a method of the class. So it looks like I do have the same output here. Now let's do one more method as part of this introduction. And this method is going to be what's called a class level or a static method. So let's do a method, say for displaying number of subjects. So number of subjects refers to the num subjects class level attribute. I do not need an object of type subject in order to access it because there's one num subject attribute shared across all subjects. So note I don't have a parameter here. Make a little note here. This is a non special class level method. And this was a non special instance level method. All right, so in here, I'll just do print number of subjects. And I'll do subject dot num subjects. And now I will do subject dot display number of subjects. And I'll run this and I should see two. And I do. Now this looks like method invocation syntax, except subject, capital S subject, is not an object reference. It's the name of a type. So we're essentially using the name of the type to qualify which method we want to execute, which is display number of subjects. This concludes a brief introduction to object-oriented programming in Python. We covered quite a few topics, but we've really only scratched the surface. From here, I highly recommend learning more about OOP and Python, like for example, learning about inheritance and decorators and all sorts of fun things. That's it. Thanks for watching.